Well, hello there. Welcome back to First Baptist Church Rosenberg's Sunday Adult Bible School. We are diving into our new lesson today about enduring how Christ enables believers to persevere with faithfulness. My name is Emily, and today we're going to dive through 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. So if you have your Bibles, um, grab them out, and we will begin with our study. Perseverance usually pays off in any context. In the spiritual realm, perseverance changes everything. The church at Thessalonica was struggling and Paul provided them with some much needed encouragement. When they were tempted to give up, Paul admonished them to stay the course. So let's, before we dive into the, the scripture for today, let's dive into the context of this letter and what Paul um, is writing about and who he's writing to. So this correspondence dated around 50 AD and it's one of uh, known as Paul's one of his earliest letters that he had written. Many scholars believe that Paul wrote his second letter to Thessalonians not long after the first epistle. Um, like Paul's initial letter, Second Thessalonians was sent out with the blessing of his traveling companions, known as Silas and Timothy. And similar to the first letter, Second Thessalonians opens with a brief blessing and prayer for grace and peace. So in some ways, 2 Thessalonians kind of summarizes Paul's message in 1 Thessalonians. So we're going to see some resemblance between the two letters, and Paul seems to do that on purpose, again, to summarize what he had said before. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into the text. Let's, so let's start with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. In his earlier letter, Paul had urged brothers and sisters in Christ to increase their faith and expand their affection for one another. You can reference that back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. But now he was grateful to see them following his direction. See, the Thessalonians' faith was growing more and more, and both in their understanding of doctrinal truth and in their willingness to actually walk out that truth. The Greek word used here refers to growth beyond measure or beyond expectation. So Paul was grateful that the Thessalonians were excelling both in embracing the doctrine and also practicing it in their lives daily. God is love, and love should define his people. But love also flows out through mature faith, which is why Paul is connecting the two ideas. You see, with while faith represents the vertical dimension between of, of Christian love, it's also ethical of horizontal direction. So Paul was, thank, was thankful that the Thessalonians were had embraced this their relationship with Christ and also having their love for Christ reflect into their relationships with one another. So that vertical and horizontal love, uh, Paul was seeing it through the Thessalonian people and he was thanking them for that. Well, let's continue now with verse four, which reads, therefore among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and in faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. See, the word boast was not flattery or arrogance, and sometimes we can confuse that word, but in the way that Paul is using it here, he's boasting, recognizing that God as one orchestrating the Thessalonian success, and he used it to challenge other congregations to follow suit. You see, Paul wasn't giving credit to only to the Thessalonians for um, what they were doing, but he was also he was mainly giving credit to God that because of God's grace and mercy, the Thessalonians were doing exceedingly well, and it was all because of their faith in Christ. See, while Paul was not specific about the attacks carried out against the Thessalonians, it is reasonable to assume that they were related to the gospel. 
However, the situation was ongoing. So Paul emphasized that they were enduring their suffering well. And this was something he understood from personal experience and, and that he experienced himself. So he had suffered persecution during this time with Thessalonica. So he understood the struggles that the Thessalonians were facing. And he acknowledges that, acknowledges that in his letter. So we're going to continue now with verse uh, verses 5 and 6. It says, All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Paul noted that the Thessalonians' endurance and persecution was evidence of God's work and their worth. Not only was the gospel worthy, Paul emphasized that the Thessalonians were worthy as well. So while their suffering didn't earn salvation, it did prove that they were living residents of the kingdom of God here on earth. And in that way, their afflictions were making them more like Christ. God would honor their faithfulness when Jesus returned. They were suffering for the sake of the gospel and their full reward was coming. And that's something to celebrate about. So now let's continue with verses seven through eight. And give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He was also just to give relief to his children. So the Greek wording here includes the idea of rest or release from troubles and the rest came in two ways. First, the Thessalonians could have peace in knowing that God was using their pain for his purpose. It wasn't going unnoticed. It wasn't going unheard. That God saw all and he knew all that was going on. But second, God would be faithful in righting wrongs, just as he'd been faithful in every aspect of their spiritual lives. And as God has been faithful, not just in the New Testament in which, place, um, in which this is taking place, but God has been faithful even in the Old Testament and even at the very beginning. So the phrase, and to us, reminded the Thessalonians that they were not alone. Paul was suffering to the gospel as well. He was suffering alongside them, even if it was different than the Thessalonians. And he, like he hopes the Thessalonians will do, he is also, he's trying to trust in God to provide that rest. So he reminds his friends that God's timing is what matters, even when his relief might not show up until the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Sometimes God's works are seen in the moment, but in many cases, the purpose behind our suffering will remain a mystery until he returns with his powerful angels. But we have hope and we can rejoice in knowing that either way, he will make it right. It may not be today, may not be tomorrow, but God is always faithful, especially in his promises to us. Now let's see verses 9 through 10 that read, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out the presence of the Lord God and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Paul used a legal term here to explain how God's enemies will be punished for their sin. The penalty included everlasting destruction. Now this destruction will take form of everlasting suffering apart from the presence of the Lord. So the absence of God, the absence of God represents hell's most ex extreme torture. And while they might ignore God's work on earth, sinners still deserve sinners will derive from the benefits of his general mercies. Um, Jesus noted that God allows the sun to rise and the rain to fall in the unjust. However, hell has no hint of God's presence or glory. People who wanted no part of God in this world will get that wish granted absolutely by being banished from him or eternity. Darkness and despair will overwhelm them with no, no hope for relief. 
So that term everlasting destruction may seem a little scary, but really what it means is that it is apart from God. And apart from God means um, to not know the presence of the Lord and, and to be further away from that. And in that, and those are for who have not believed and have chosen to walk away from God. But because the Thessalonians accepted Paul's testimony, they could trust God to avenge their suffering. And they could rest in the fact that their future was secure in Christ. They had believed in what he had shared and their faith made all the difference. Verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. You see, their salvation was already secured in what Christ had did on the cross. But instead, it reminded them of their responsibility to provide evidence of their relationship with Christ. Genuine believers constantly nurture their spiritual growth and strive every day to be more like Jesus. We are all trophies of God's grace, but we can live in a way that draws his approval rather than his displeasure. You see, Paul's prayer also included a petition for God to help Thessalonians to experience God's approval. He asked that the Father's power would equip them to, as quoted, to bring to fruition your desire for goodness and lead them deeper into every deed prompted by faith. As we conclude, we get to verse 12. It says, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 12, Paul continues, or so in this verse, Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians, more specifically, it explains the result of living as a worthy residence in the kingdom of God. Ultimately, the, the mission of believers is to point others to the Savior. This was the emphasis of Paul's prayers for the Thessalonians. While he prayed that they would continue in good works and do great things, those good works should always honor the name of the Lord. For Paul, the name of Jesus was tied to his position as Lord and Messiah. So Paul called on the Thessalonians to exalt Jesus by revealing him as Savior. Of course, believers are progressively being made into Christ's glorious image every day. But that process would not be accomplished in this life. See, our ultimate glorification will be the final resort, result of the spiritual transformation initiated by the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as salvation and sanctification dependent on his grace, our final state and eternity also depends completely on him. We cannot earn it or work for it, but through his unmerited favor, we will all be like him. As you can see, there's a pattern that Paul states throughout his letters that we are called to, um, to be reminded that our faith and our salvation is not dependent on how well we do or the things that we accomplish, but it's all on the cross. But when we go through suffering, when we go through having to endure many situations and many circumstances, just like Paul is urging Thessalonians, even today, when we read this passage, we can be reminded that God does not unnotice our pain. He does not um, ignore our suffering. He does not ignore uh, what we encounter on this earth, but he sees it all just like he saw Paul and just like he saw the Thessalonians. So we have um, faith and we can rejoice in knowing that God will always keep his promises and that we, even though we may not understand why we are going through a tough season or a tough time in our lives, we can be reminded in knowing that um, God has always been faithful, and even if we might not know the reason behind um, our suffering or other people's suffering, um, we know that one day we will know, and that every day that we continue to press forward in our faith, every day that we continue to, um, every day we continue to pray 
and um, lift God as our as our Lord and Savior, declare Him as Savior of our lives. Um, we are continuing more to be like him and to be like Christ. Um, and that in a way can bring other people around us to learn more about Christ and who he is. So thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure to walk you through this lesson. And my prayer and hope is that today you will be encouraged and uplifted um, in this passage. So I'm going to close out in prayer and we will be uh, done with today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for um, the ability to uh, come together as believers no matter where we are. And we have the ability to worship you, to look at your scripture, and to learn more about you. And God, we, we thank you for the grace and the mercy and the beautiful gift of salvation that you give us. And Father, I pray as we continue in this world, as we face a world full of suffering, whether that's around us or in our own lives. God, we trust that you are a good God. We trust that we, you know what you are doing. And we pray, Lord, that we continue to have that faith and that trust and hope, Lord, that we are in your hands, that your plans and your ways are always for our good. And Father, we pray that our enduring and our suffering, Lord, will glorify your name and will lift, lift you up, Lord. So we thank you again for all that you do. Help us in our times of need. Help us in our suffering. And we trust, Lord, that you are shaping us every day to be more like you. Help us to love others and to treat others the way we should. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope to see you next week.